In this module, we'll be looking at the arts of Africa before 1800, but we'll be starting at the very beginning, well before the Neolithic period, because Africa is widely seen to be the birthplace of humanity, with the history of humans going back over 70,000 years ago. So it probably goes as no surprise that we see some of the first art in Africa. Some of the first records of cultural production can be found in the African continent. The continent of Africa is an extremely large body of land made up of hundreds of nations with hundreds if not thousands of different cultures that go back well before the Neolithic period. Today, over 680 million people live in Africa, and although much of the continent is sparsely inhabited, there are regions that are very densely populated. For example, however, most Africans live in rural areas and their, center, their lifestyle centers around agricultural activities. The climate is also extremely diverse. In the areas that are not heavily urbanized, Africa's geography and climate has been very much impacted um, by artistic traditions. In agricultural communities, the patterns of life are very much uh, centered around the dry and wet seasons and uh, cultivation, and therefore their cultural practices. Dry seasons allow for people to work part-time um, as artisans to create artifacts and for people to organize festivals and other large-scale social events. Um, during the uh, uh, during the rainfall seasons, the activities would be based largely around cultivation and agriculture. Certain areas in Africa, especially in Central Africa, has experienced frequent droughts over its history, and so people have been forced into sometimes nomadic lifestyles. And so artistic expression can take the form of body ornamentation and ephemeral, um, ephemeral uh, works of art, rather than large-scale, more permanent uh, um, works like wooden sculpture or architecture. Humankind's origins can be traced to Africa and therefore we find the first traces of, of cultural expression here. And there have recently been some major discoveries, especially in the south of Africa, uh, that show evidence of the earliest um, documents of human creativity. I'm showing you here one of the earliest examples of rock art that is found in Africa, dating back at least 23,000 BCE or 25,000 years ago. The stone was found on the uh, floor of a cave buried under sediment and debris, and it was discovered in 1969 by a team of German archaeologists led by W.E. Wendt. He excavated this rock shelter and found the first fragment, which was the left side. A few years later, he returned and found the other half. And so you can see that what might seem like blurry perhaps even accidental markings in rocks, once they're combined, you get the very clear form of some kind of animal viewed and rendered in profile. This silhouette of an animal, and we see uh, you know, a face in profile and four legs, perhaps a tail, and perhaps genitalia, um, can all be seen um, in this kind of black silhouette drawn with charcoal suspended in some kind of medium to make it stick to the rock. And these are very small pieces of stone slab, so they're not fixed to the 
wall of the cave, but rather, as I said, found on the floor, perhaps even portable. Went called these the Apollo Levin stones because when he was in the midst of his excavations, he heard on his shortwave radio the news of NASA's successful space mission to the moon. So in this, uh, these rocks that represent the first traces of human creativity in the ancient era bear the title of this kind of promise of future space exploration. It's sort of an interesting combination of, of ancient art with future, uh, the promise of the future. The rock shelter where the Apollo 11 stones were found um, is in the Han Mountains of Namibia on the southwest coast of Africa, which is now part of the um, Richtersfeld Transfrontier Park, a public park. The rock shelter overlooks a dry gorge and sits 20 meters above what was once a river that ran along the valley floor. The cave entrance is wide, about 20 meters across, and the cave itself is deep. Um, it's about 11 meters from front to back. And while today a person could stand upright only in the front section of the cave, during the Middle Stone Age and probably the periods right before and after, the rock shelter was an active site of ongoing settlement. And we know this because other Objects were found in this area, blades, pointed flex, and a scraper. Um, these are all materials that are not native to the region, which shows us that probably stone technology was um, brought with nomadic people and transported over long distances. Among the remnants in this cave were uh, hearths, so people were building fires. Also ostrich eggshell fragments that bared the traces of red color um, that were also found, which shows that there might have been ornamental painting or the evidence of eggshells that were used um, possibly for the containers for the pigments. So what do we learn from the Apollo 11 stones? As I mentioned, uh, there are other from the other objects found here, we see that this was a place that people, uh, probably nomadic people, stopped and sought shelter over many, many uh, generations, over many hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, the form of the object is very simplistic. It is a profile which gives us the most information about the animal. It shows us um, all four legs and gives us a sense that this is an animal possibly with, um, you know, uh, horns, possibly a bovid um, animal that could include oxen, bison, water buffalo, or cattle, possibly the sort of um, uh, hunted animal in this region. Some scholars have suggested that this might be some kind of supernatural creature, part human, part animal. Um, if so, this could suggest a complex system of uh, shamanistic beliefs. Um, Whatever it is, it shows that this was more than just a cave offering shelter from the elements. It was also a place of ritual significance used over many thousands of years. Jumping ahead about 20,000 years or so, uh, we can also find rock art in the North African region. Here I'm showing you a um, image that has been called Running Horned Woman. This was found in a cave that is a fairly difficult place to access on a plateau in the Algerian section of the Sahara Desert near the borders of Libya and Niger in, the nor in northern Africa. Running Horned Woman was found on an isolated rock whose base was hollowed out into a number of small shelters that really couldn't have been used as 
dwellings. They were difficult to access and not hospitable to human occupation. The image depicts a female with two horns on her head, dots all over her body, and we see that here, that might represent um, body ornamentation or scarification. Um, and she is wearing such attributes of dance, like armlets uh, here and garters that seem to have uh, some kind of fabric attached. And it suggests that there is a tremendous amount of movement. There is a, a sense of animation and liveliness that is completely absent from the Apollo 11 stone. The early um, archaeologists of this site, understanding the remoteness of the location and this, the extreme kind of vibrancy of this pictorial image, suge it suggested to them that the um, subject of the painting fell outside of the everyday, that this was a place and a subject that represents ritualistic activity. The Great Zimbabwe has been described as one of the most dramatic architectural landscapes in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, it is the largest stone complex in Africa built before the modern era. And aside from monumental architecture uh, we see in ancient Egypt, it is probably the greatest ruins that survive in, uh, on, the con on the continent of Africa. It's about a four hour drive south of Zimbabwe's present day capital of Harare. It was constructed between the 11th and 15th centuries and was continuously inhabited by the Shona peoples until about 15, uh, 1450. Uh, the Shona people are the largest ethnic group in Zimbabwe. It wasn't, however, a singular complex. At the time, uh, during the kind of cultural peak of this settlement, it is estimated that about seven comparable states existed in this region. The word Zimbabwe translates from the Bantu language of the Shona to either judicial center or ruler's court or house. Um, so it was clearly an important place for the elite or for a royal family. A few of the individual Zimbabwe's or houses have survived over the centuries. So what we have are really the most stable and uh, strongest stone structures that would have inhabited, uh, that would have housed uh, the ruling class. The stone structures of the Great Zimbabwe um, can be grouped into roughly three areas. The hill ruin on the rocky hilltop up above that can be dated to 1250 and incorporates a cave that is still sacred to the Shona people, uh, but this cave once accommodated the residence of a ruler and his immediate family. The great enclosure down below, which includes the circular wall that you saw on the previous slide, and the lower valley enclosures. A soapstone stone sculpture of a bird resting on top of a register of zigzags uh, was unearthed here, and it has um, it represents a a uh, bird of prey, and scholars have suggested that it could have been emblematic of the power of Shona kings here as benefactors to their people and intercessors with their ancestors.